that assertion is laughable. And he says that the document was as laid by the session. And he points out that if there's anything at all, it should fall at the office of the clerk of the National Assembly because he took custody of the document during the period of, of Xmas break. And he also adds that if copies were to be reproduced, it was required to be done by the Office of the Budget or the National Planning for the, uh, the National Assembly. However, uh, Senator Itaina, who is in, in caught in between this, says that it is a controversy between his two bosses, the Presidency and the Senate, and for now, no comment. <laughs> well, I'll just walk by let's take other headlines, but it appears to me that uh, this is a storm in a teacup. Well, yes, it is. Uh, it's a storm in a teacup. I mean, there's nothing uh, really controversial about this. Mm -hmm. And then the use of, of the word missing is can the budget be said to be missing or uh, assuming uh, it was exchanged? And it means that it was swapped. Uh, rather than saying that the budget was missing, the House well, has the language the city president used was that it was switched. Yes, it means to change the original uh, swapped for another, another. Swapped. deliberately switched. swapped. So it, was, it is not confirmed that. whether it was inadvertent mm -hmm. or deliberate. But be that as it may, I think the way forward is get the copy that the president laid and let's move the nation forward. Yeah, I'm moving the you will recall that yeah. even in the House of Rep, the speaker is already proposing that the procedure for debating the budget is already behind time. Mm -hmm. So we need to gain time and move the nation forward. Absolutely. And I think that there's nothing that also stops the lawmakers from interrogating the pro proposals and the budget and say, so we agree with this, we don't agree with this. I think that's part of their powers. But well, whichever and one that is in their, uh, in their possession. <laughs> okay, let's uh, go ahead now with uh, other, other headlines. Uh, from Vanguard newspaper at the foot of the front page of Vanguard, medical doctor dies of Lassa fever in rivers. Details of that can be found on uh, page six. And another story on Lassa fever from Nigerian pilot on the front page says, Lassa fever death toll hits 44 and kills medical doctor in uh, Port Harcourt. Mm -hmm. On The Guardian, that's the second lead story on the front page of The Guardian. It says, patients flee as doctor of Lassa fever victims dies. And government sets up isolation center in Port Harcourt, 15 on surveillance, 35 identified as contact persons. And Lassuth denies admitting patients. Well, so on the Lassa fever uh, issue, we have one on the, the bottom page of the nation, just uh, the photograph you have the Lassa fever doctor expectant doctor expectant mom die in rivers. Uh, that is the story for the Lassa fever with the nation this morning. And uh, just uh, to go on to other stories, we have uh, that of the Chibok girls. So I have the photograph there. We're still with the nation. Agony of mothers. Some of the parents of the Chibok girls crying during a meeting with President Muhammadu Buhari at the presidential villa in Abuja yesterday. The details of the story we find on page nine. Chibok women march on to villa. Uh, well, just to take another story, there's yes. a question now before we go over to bio mm -hmm. on the Chibok girls from the Guardian, the front page of the Guardian, uh, with details on page three. It says, Buhari orders fresh probe, probe into missing Chibok girls. That's uh, on the front page of the Guardian, also for the Nigerian pilot, Buhari constitutes pro panel on Chibok girls' abduction. Details can be found on uh, page five of uh, the uh, Nigerian pilot. Bio. Yes, thank you. Uh, the issue of Lassa fever, the doctor is said to have been the doctor that treated the patient that died of Lassa fever in, in Port Harcourt. Unfortunately, he too has fallen victim. And that caused a stampede because patients in the hospital uh, started packing their belongings and uh, leaving. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Commissioner for Health in the River State has, says, says that 15 people are under surveillance and 35 others are being uh, contacted uh, to be put under surveillance. The, the Minister for Health, uh, Professor Isaac Adewali, has lamented that Although Lassa fever is native to West Africa, it's regrettable that it, it has not been contained. He points out that there was slow alarm in raising Lassa fever when it occurred August in Mina. Quite unlike, you remember in the Ebola case, Dr. Mayo Adadevo quickly triggered the alarm and something was able to do. The other regretting thing is that there are nine laboratories in the country that could take care of uh, like hemorrhagic fever. Just Only nine. six of them are working. In fact, the one that is specifically for Lassa fever, I saw a report the other day on television showing that
of Tompolo. Details of that can be found on page 12. And on page 9, in greater detail, but promoted on the alleged 400 million naira fraud, EFCC files seven count charge against Metu. And uh, of course, those are the headlines that uh, are dealing with uh, issues of alleged fraud from the papers I have. All right, so looking at uh, alleged fraud, uh, of course, uh, I'll talk on the Metu story first. The nation uh, has just below. Uh, the matter there, Metu transferred uh, 21 million naira to Aneni, EFCC alleges, with Ryder PDP spokesman faces seven count uh, charge. Uh, still taking a look at the um, issue of uh, arms deal, uh, the Daily Trust has this uh, story, arms deal, EFCC swoops on ex-service chief, the details you find on page three of uh, the Daily Trust. So and uh, I, I, I it's significant, I think we should take a look at... Uh, yeah, there, there are promotional copies, mm -hmm. uh, okay. headlines, mm -hmm. from the vanguard below the state flag, 50 years after Operation Damisa. Uh, it says that, uh, that this is where the, there's a special report from vanguard at pages 37 to 40. And it says it's exactly 50 years today since the military adventurers fostered the successful coup on the nation. The coup not only shaped Nigeria's democracy, uh, it also led to the killings of prominent political leaders. Now, details of that can be found uh, inside the pages of uh, Vanguard. And the Guardian also has a promotional copy. That's this weekend cover, page 27, 50 years after Unziogu. Uh, that's the, right there. I'm sure Blessing mm. is also coming to that. Yes, yes I have that uh, as well. January 15, 66 school, Akintola, Adigbe Rose Sons. Open up 50 years after the Daily Sun has that just uh, below the photograph of uh, uh, the Kaduna State Governor and the Emir of, of, of course, uh, Sultan of Sokoto. January 1566 school, Akintola Adigbero's sons opened up 50 years after. And uh, for the nation, we have it as a North Leaders Review 1966 school in Kaduna. Well, all the details you find on the inside pages of the nation as well as the Daily Sun this morning. Okay, Raya, let's... Uh, yes. Uh, there are two perspectives on the stories about corruption. First, uh, uh, government, Ekwo in June 27, so 2009. So how should a day like this be for, for all of us? Yes, it's very significant because it, uh, it reinforced the armed forces to the de defending the territorial integrity of our nation. All right, the I, uh, we're committed to doing that too on the show this morning. At this point, I think uh, we must go and uh, take a look at some other things on the program this morning. Thank you very much. Monday is another day. Thank you. Take a look at what is happening. This is Good Morning Nigeria. We'll take uh, this break to bring some messages and it will be time for our conversation proper, talking about Remembrance Day, as we've talked about all morning. <laughs> This background report, our correspondent, Simon Macham, asks the question, how should our heroes be celebrated? The Armed Forces and Remembrance Day is a day set aside to honor members of the Nigerian Armed Forces whose primary duty is to protect Nigeria's territorial integrity and defend it from any form of aggression. Even though this day began with celebrating those who fought in the First and Second World Wars, Nigeria has since chosen the 15th of January to coincide with a significant day in the nation's history. This is the day in 1970 when Nigeria's civil war came to an end, thereby ensuring that Nigeria remained one indivisible united nation. As expected, the armed forces played a significant role in this war and many lost their lives while others lived to tell the tale. Therefore, the Armed Forces Remembrance Day is centered on honoring those who paid the supreme price for Nigeria and those who survived and are living under different conditions across the country. 
Thus, the ritual is for members of the armed forces comprising the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Nigerian Legion to converge on different centers across the nation to honor fallen colleagues and reflect on the life of service to the nation. At such ceremonies where political leadership is visible and fully involved, speeches are read, pigeons released, reads laid, the last post played, parade staged, gun salutes rendered, and prayers offered. But beyond these ceremonies, the question of the welfare of It's a way of honoring the dead in different circumstances, either in war, natural disasters, or any other monumental tragedy that struck leading to death and has a long history. This explains why most countries of the world have cenotaphs, including Nigeria. Kaduna State was the headquarters of Northern Region during the colonial administration, has a cenotaph erected at the Mutala Mohammed Square in honor of soldiers who died at the World Wars. In the military language, we call it Dogoyaro. Now, he has been raised up, I think last year, there was, being this, this place, Mutala Square is an open space. Everybody came here to do what he likes and left. The structure that was raised up in the, in the of Dogoyaro was destroyed by a certain bad element. So, but now, I think Kaduna State Government are finding one way or the other where they can have a permanent place to establish this place which is be used. No intervention again. In Kanu, the arcade of the unknown Suja, which was constructed in 1972, was later turned into a park known as Malankatu Square. It suffered neglect until recently. When part of the park was converted to Moto Park, the remaining part, which has the unknown Suja, was given a facelift as it became radiant, preparatory to the January 15th remembrance ceremony. During my regime now, I take care of that place. Before, then just leave it the place, a reject. That is a reject. Don't go do urinate, toilet, uh, all this. Uh, our boys go smoke this and this for that place. The concern is that if senators like this, is meant to remember the fallen heroes. Why not give him proper maintenance from time to time instead of waiting for Armed Forces Remembrance Day to come? Stakeholders in the preservation of national monuments speak on why some of them are not attended to. They come under the National Commission of if they are declared. So maybe, maybe they have not sent any requisition to that effect. I do believe we have seen anything to that, then we could have maybe forwarded for a recommendation that it could be uh, included in the Schedules Monument. So they said remembrance of the fallen heroes should not be once in a year, but always, hence cenotaphs should be monuments where people can visit from time to time to remember loved ones whose bodies lie elsewhere. In Kaduna, this conversation, and that first question will go to uh, General Saleh. General, General Saleh, how does it feel like? I mean, the number of us are very timid. Of course, if you take Nigeria's population, uh, about 170 million, all of us are not military men. Uh, but for you know, a man or a woman to wake up and say, hey, listen, I'm going to join the military in order to uh, provide security for others, there must be some motivation. Uh, what motivated you and still what motivates others to say they will stand up to fight for the fatherland? Uh, well, let me speak for myself and share my experience on why <laughs> I ended up in the, in the military for 30 years. I think it's a simple nature of a young man to appreciate uniform and to do th tough things. For me, it was as simple as that. Until you get into the military, until you are sworn in, and you have really some experience of the purpose of your service, before you can understand what the military is all about. But then, aside from the highfalutin expressions that we always have, that it is the highest honor service to, to, uh, to the nation, what you find in the military is the spirit of comradeship, the total spirit of camaraderie, the loyalty and dedication to your commanders, to your unit, and most of all, identifying buddies that become lifetime relations of yours in the military. It is better expressed in combat. 
uh, because you live to combat with also the high polluting idea of going to defend your nation. But it comes down to the brass tack when the bullets start flying that what you need to do is to hold up to the integrity of your unit. And it boils down to, the, to, to fighting for your commander because your commander really becomes the icon that represents what mission you have. And it further boils down wet when actually the blood and the gut start to pour, that what you need to do is to be there alive to protect and defend your comrade. Mm. So basically, uh, I don't know if I'm sounding very poetic about this, but to <laughs> me as a soldier who has been in it, this is the very essence of military life. It's about comradeship, and if the battle is won, ultimately it is won for the integrity of the nation. But this is basically the heart of a young man who comes in not actually knowing what it means to do the ultimate sacrifice for your nation. So if your commitment to your comrade, if your commitment to share your life and give it away and leave your family for months on end, and never to come back again, translates ultimately into investing your life for your family and your community. Then, in a poetic sense, uh, this is the heart of a young man from the ages 16 to 24, or when there is a script, conscription, to higher years of 30 to 35, who find themselves committed to the highest profession any nation can ever offer its citizen. All right, uh, General Saleh, thank you very much. Let's also get uh, the uh, reaction of uh, you know, uh, Major General uh, Suleiman Ali. And you actually, because you know what you're going into actually. You just um, admire and you want to go in and you put in your best and you get enlisted. It is when you go in there and see the effect and what, uh, what it entails. That's when you now understand you are in a job that uh, uh, is not going back. Uh, you might as well just settle down and take care of yourselves in terms of uh, being a comrade to each other, uh, be, being comrades to each other, and the camaraderie, the esprit de corps, and love yourselves. Because at the end of the day, we fight together, and at the, you, you, you have no any other brother apart from uh, your colleague. Uh, that's why you, you see even in retirement, uh, soldiers are still, are still friends because that's you, the family you know. After leaving your main family, you go in there, it is day in, day out, you're together, you train together, you go into combat together, so you become uh, blood uh, relations, more, more, more or less. So, would you, would you say, uh, Major General uh, uh, Ali, what you saw joining the, the military dying is what still obtains today for the, for the group, the young the crop of young people today? Who does readily still want to feel the same way like you are uh, you're feeling or even uh, general Saleh himself i might even say that young men these days that want to go into the military despite the insurgency and the and the uh, issues uh, we are, the challenges we are facing they are they may be even more courageous than uh, than young men of those days that uh, that to say those who join the army the military now they do. They join the military out of patriotism. There are people who join because one, they have been roaming the streets and uh, they want to get employed. And um, if they start selling military forms, they see that as an opportunity for somebody to get employed. So there are others that, for right from childhood, somebody will make up his mind. I will have to. I want to be a military man. And the person keeps trying, keeps trying. You discover that somebody will try three, four, five, ten times until age catches up on him before some of them succeed, others don't. Then when we talk of uh, motivation, motivation has to do with the way, you know, those who are already in service, the way they are treated. Those who are already in service, the way they are treated, you know, could be a motivation to those who are out there. If government shows um, uh, cold shoulders towards service personnel, then there will be no motivation. But when you see people are prompted or they are well kitted, they are well looked after in the battlefront, they look smart on the road. When they wear their uniforms, they are uh, something to admire. Then that is what we call motivation. You, are, you, you get motivated by seeing what 
the person you want to emulate what he goes through, what his experience is. So, of an enemy, you must respect the human in the concept of an enemy. Because in a military sense, it is what your political master conceptualizes as your opponent that you take as such. But it will interest you that even your opponent who is in uniform is also your comrade. Because in a global sense, the military, we are one huge family. If today I find myself, so to speak, without quite attributing, but uh, making it definite. If I find myself today in a country where it is said to have the best or the highest military in the world, and I introduce myself as a brigadier general, it's a straight, simple respect. Nobody bothers whether I'm, I'm a Nigerian or, uh, or, a, or a country lesser than that. So a day like this is a day you really do a deep thinking about the kind of lives that are destroyed by the bombs and bullets and the total innecessity of war itself. Nations that had fought themselves so bitterly, built coalitions and split the world into two of the First and the Second World Wars are today, are, are today in sociocultural and economic unions. And they make decisions for how you and I enjoy the peace and happiness of the world. So today, yes, it is a day that you celebrate humanity and the importance of living in peace and harmony. But speaking also as a military, uh, uh, as a military mind, And in those front lines, I could imagine I to be, well, it's better left to imagine. But let's share your experience here. Yeah. For a day like this, January 15, of course, beyond the ritual, the annual ritual, the fanfare, celebration, different talks, promises, what else should we do? More stock taking? The general just talked about so many things that have been a fallout out of even the different types of war. But the people are there. Some of you are still serving. Tomorrow you will be the heroes that we want to be celebrating as well, even as we are still there serving. What should a day like this be for a nation such as Nigeria, even amongst other celebrations in the world? Okay, I would say that um, at home here, we have chosen January 15th as um, our day to remember our fallen heroes. Um, every aspect or every uh, company of the nation ought to have a role to play in making sure our fallen heroes rest in peace and the families they live behind are taken care of. Corporate Nigeria, the media, the serving personnel, governments of different states, you could see on one of the clips there, one governor was saying he was supposed to fix the Senate up and all that. These are responsibilities that uh, we shouldn't wait until we have a day like this before we think of uh, fixing them. Uh, armed forces are our pride. Those who laid down their lives for us. Like that uh, takes us again to uh, Colonel, retired Colonel Gaia, chairman of the Nigerian Legion. Uh, you listen to the other guests, uh, first the philosophical perspective provided by General Saleh, and now also the practical perspective provided by the serving director in charge of Veterans Affairs Division of the Federal Ministry of Defense. What does a day like this mean to you and to your colleagues beyond the brass band and the parades? Well, as um, rightly put by the, I mean by the general, it is a period of uh, sober reflection. We just discussed motivation. The essence of this day, one, to remember our colleagues, heroes and heroines who gave their yesterday for our today, those of them that uh, paid the supreme price to keep Nigeria one during the Civil War, those of them that paid the supreme price to give Nigeria a good name in the international community by way of uh, taking part in various global peacekeeping operations, then the ongoing war against insurgency. You know, when you have people who are still serving, you know, motivation means, you know, 
you are doing something to encourage the person, the likely person who is coming behind. So those of them that are serving, you know, when the nation appreciates those that have paid the supreme price, somebody who is still serving believes that, well, tomorrow it might be me. Tomorrow it might be Mr. A or B. That is to say, when I'm no longer there, the nation is always there by me. But um, as also rightly put, it goes. Somebody who's out there believes that ah, if for any reason I lose my arm, my hand, or my leg, government is government will be there to provide an, an alternative. So that is the essence of this period. All right, thank you very much, uh, Colonel Mike uh, Gaya. Retired uh, for for. Uh, for us to continue on uh, to what extent some of these conditions being looked into, the pitiable condition, even the neglect, we'll have to take a look at how best to actually bring the support better than what we're having presently. But right now, uh, my colleague uh, Claire Abdullah Barazak is at the National Arcade and uh, she's going to be joining us uh, live now to take a feel of what is happening right there, even on a day like this. Good morning to you, Claire. What is the situation at the National Arcade like this morning? How is it uh, been looked into to celebrating our national heroes? Well, I'm um, Kingsley and blessing the activities uh, here at the National Arcade, of course, uh, marks the high point in the activities uh, marking the Armed Forces uh, Remembrance Day celebration. But let me quickly talk a little bit about uh, the solar tap, uh, which is uh, right behind me. Now, the idea to erect um, a solar tap of an unidentified uh, soldier, of course, who died in the course of fighting a war uh, for his or her fatherland was uh, a British conception. It was first uh, conceived, we hear. the uh, immortalization beyond the aesthetic value it adds to the landscape what can it tell us about the heroes of, uh, of our great country well thank you very much the national arcade is very significant in the life of Nigeria as it is a place where all of us who Indeed, we respect them and honor them at this National Arcade every year. Okay, the activities, you know, the conduct of the activities here has a set order. Uh, you have, of course, the president coming in to inspect the static guards of uh, honor mounted by the Brigade of Guards. Then there's the uh, lane of wreath and, of course, the 21-gun salute. Now, that interests me. The 21-gun salute, what's the significance? The significance of the 21-gun salute is to give respect, pay respect to the, the fallen heroes. And remember them for the supreme sacrifice they paid for the nation. Mm -hmm. So what's significant about this year's celebration? The significant this year's celebration is, is so significant in the sense that we are at a time that we are fighting insurgency in the Northeast. And indeed, Nigerian soldiers and officers and men are fighting outside the country in terms of peace support operations. And so being the protector of democracy in Nigeria, the military uh, you know, believes that this celebration is one that will always be remembered and it will be of a great uh, you know, value to the lives of the serving soldiers and to also inspire them to work hard and the nation will always stand by them if at the end of Uh, entitled to, to benefits are uh, for now receiving it. It's just that some of our standing arrears have not been paid. I think that is just what, that, what they are talking about. Otherwise, we are grateful to the government for everything else. All right. Um, the, you hear it, of course. That's uh, the uh, chairman of the, sorry, the secretary general of the Nigerian Legion, Captain John Adole Kingsley and Blessing. The president is expected to be here uh, later on, of course, to, like I said, earlier on, inspect uh, the guards of honor and then lay the wreath uh, at the two. Thereafter, of course, release the pigeons, which symbolize peace and, of course, the end of uh, this whole uh, activity of the Armed Forces Remembrance Day. It's back to you. All right, Clive, thank you very much for uh, reporting to us live from uh, the National Arcade in Abuja. Of course, the National Arcade is also opposite the Eagle Square and within the three uh, 
um, zone sure. in the Federal Capital Territory. Thank you very much, Dr. Claire, uh, for that live uh, report. Now we're back to the studios with our guest, uh, General Suleiman Aliu, uh, Director of Veterans Division, uh, Veterans Affairs Division, Federal Minister of Defense, uh, Brigadier General Saleh Bala, uh, retired, of course, now in private practice, as well as, of course, the Chairman of the Nigerian Legion. We we'll still have them in the studios. Let, let's, gentlemen, let's uh, uh, return to a very sensitive matter, and I would like us to take it off from the point of uh, the unknown soldier. That's the arcade always, uh, that's where the, uh, you know, the memorial uh, is. And this leads us to a point uh, that some commentators have often observed that uh, uh, in combat, it would appear that uh, when uh, we look War is seen from the perspective of winning and losing. And to have an impression out there that you're losing men, men isn't quite a good thing for a politician. Mm. But it is a reality with the people, and it is a core reality with the military, because the military knows it's, it's losing its comrades. But where, in essence, the world is not supposed, the world, so to speak, the society, is not, to have, is not meant to have an impression, uh, the, real, the, the reality that the war is not lost, but that people are being lost. And then there is a shroud of secrecy around that reality that the chaos of war is actually taking people. Then you have a situation like this, that you have secret burials, that casualty are not, uh, 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 are not declared, even in a context of democracy, that they're, the very essence of democracy is about transparency and accountability, and that soldiers are citizens, they are human beings themselves, and that you give an impression that wars are being fought and no soldier is dying, but deep within the reality of governance, you know quite well that you are doing secret burials so that you don't generate a, uh, a national emotion like the lessons the Americans learned in, in Vietnam, Vietnam is right. that they had to call back their troops because the people said, come, our sons and daughters are being slaughtered in a war that we do not have a connection in the triangle, and we want them back. So if I, against this background, I go back to your question. Declaring casualty and doing elaborate burials itself brings the people into the essence, into the reality of the war. That's right. It is a communication strategy. But it all depends, I'm not overblaming our rulers, the politicians, but in essence, this, it, uh, this is what happens. I've lost hundreds of colleagues in Liberia, as well as on, uh, the ongoing uh, uh, crisis, insurgency in the Northeast. And there are quite a lot of officers and men that are not declared. But the politician sets the agenda and knows best the, the, the strategy that he or she wants to communicate. But I think for any young man who has been called into the highest profession, any nation can offer itself. The military profession is the only profession anywhere in the world where your letter of employment as an 18-year-old graduating into commission is actually signed by the president commander in chief it is the highest in any nation at the age of 21 you graduate and you are actually given a parchment of commission you read it and you you shudder you graduate you get into the unit as a platoon commander and you are given 33 men at the basic whose families at the end you will find out
Nigerians. Our fearless officers and men of the Nigerian military As a particular manufacturer, Risco Fruits produces badly made in Nigeria products for every feeding for all Nigerians. Our sons and daughters can have better jobs and our economy can become bigger and stronger. Every time you buy imported products, you are importing unemployment, terrorism, kidnapping, crime and poverty into Nigeria. Please let us shine our eyes. Buy your products. Buy made in Nigeria because only Nigerian can make Nigeria great. Always buy made in Nigerian products like Lijiko, Tomato Test, Seasoning Cubes and other made in Nigerian products. Support us to produce more products, create more employment and grow our economy. As Nigerian manufacturers, we cannot afford to joke with your well-being, do the smart thing, and support government policies to make our economy great for all of us. With Jigo Tomato Paste, Seasoning Cubes, and other great products are proudly made in Nigeria by Erisco Foods Limited. All right, just before the uh, commercial interlude, you had an NTA special tribute to Nigeria's fallen heroes. You're still watching Good Morning Nigeria, and we are reaching you on the network service of the NTA. It's a live broadcast. Now, we uh, have a Twitter handle, as you can see on the uh, screen there. A number of tweets have also come in. So, let's, let's take uh, a few of these tweets quickly before okay. we go back to our uh, guest. Uh, there's yes. one from... Uh Uh, right at the cadet school, you are taught on how to uh, take care of the sick and wounded and the dead in combat. Uh, at the intense of the heat of combat, we have what we call field barriers. If someone dies, if any of you, uh, the soldiers die in, in, in combat, there's field barrier, which is uh, temporary. And um, usually at the end of conflicts, these bodies are exhumed and brought back what you know to the cities where they belong and given proper national burial now the heat of combat could be one of the major reasons why not every uh, soldier that dies is brought back to the city or to where he comes from to be given the national burial because the combat is still going on uh, i believe which of course usually when you have a field burial you mark the grave and then continue combat with the uh, th that was done during the civil war it's uh, when you look at the burial that we were referring to informally the other time, that like the C-130 crash of uh, 1992, when our soldiers, our officers um, had this accident, then there was no conflict. It was uh, a peaceful time. So the nation had the opportunity and time to organize a national burial for those officers. And like uh, whoever, like say, witnessed that burial will never forget that the, those uh, officers were honored. The same thing, there was a crash in uh, uh, 2000 and if I'm correct, uh, do, do, you know, of uh, our journey. More than 37 different types of uh, professors we yeah. teach them as they, as they discharge from the, from the armed forces. So that equips them to be able to survive, even if, apart from their pension, they could do something. The lacuna that already existed is seed money. You know, like when they come out, okay, they have, you've taught this guy how to maybe do falconizing, but he doesn't have a falconizing machine. You know, I'm just talking about the basics. That's right. So um, we at the Veteran Affairs Division have started uh, a program where we, you know, uh, the Legion, in, in conjunction with Legion, we're going to form them into cooperatives and uh, they'll be able to access all the available federal government incentives uh, that are Smedan, uh, small scale industries, uh, and uh, SME uh, facilities, those offered by the Central Bank and Co. We are that process. Okay, uh, Major General uh, Leo, let, yes. let's take a look at what uh, Colonel uh, Gaia feels about some of those things that are in place. Yes, for so many of them, having left uh, the service, they found themselves in one way or the other, having to do something different from what they've been trained to do yeah. in the first instance. Fitting back into that society might be a little bit difficult. But the main thing, you've talked about pension and some other things. We know about a time in this country, military may have to ex military may have to kill some even dropping dead online. What is the situation right now? Issue of pension, uh, the conditions generally, what do we have on our hands today and where do we need to improve on? Colonel uh, Gaya. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Honestly, I must um, give credit to government for the effort so far. Those of you that uh, have stayed in Abuja for 
5, 10, 5, 10, 15 years. is collecting now. So there is a very big gap, but I'm happy to inform, I mean, inform us that um, I met the chairman of um, the military pensions board and uh, he authoritatively told me that uh, government, he, has, he is trying to put on a paper to government, you know, for possible uh, harmonization of our salaries. So in a nutshell, um, salary, our pensions are received regularly we only expect and request government to effect these two areas, pay the remaining areas in one bit, then harmonize our monthly pensions. All right, uh, Colonel Gaya, thank you very much there for uh, your remarks. Let's uh, return to a point that General uh, Suleiman Aliyu made earlier. He said uh, we would need to go beyond government uh, in terms of seeking support for uh, veterans, in other words, corporates calling on corporate uh, social responsibility, as mm -hmm. it were. Uh, General uh, Saleh Bala, what's your take on this? Um, thanks. Uh, by it seems uh, we were communicating intuitively. I was going to beg to uh, <laughs> to jump into <laughs> my, my 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 very senior colleagues' uh, conversation. We have to beat ourselves into reality that uh, the global economy is getting. Government is getting less in by government will need to be taken care of and compensated later on. What do you think about the concept of 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 military of of uh, of military contractors like me, who actually is employed by who could be employed by a government to go and help in the war effort? You think I don't do it with a commitment or a passion to my country? What happens to me if I am killed? What happens to my family? So one has a claim. But then to extend it, I just came back from a privileged tour with the Minister for Interior, Lieutenant General uh, Bello Abrahman Dambazo to the Northeast. And I have never been so emotionally touched. I went to a camp. And, 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 and ruling would, and governance will be at that time. So we should start to make quantum leap of thoughts. That's beyond, autocracy. Beyond that. <laughs> Good. General, uh, Alil, just okay. to uh, elaborate on this, because you uh, actually uh, stoked it uh, by saying, listen, we, will get, we need to get more uh, yeah. from other stakeholders. What would you like to see done, just in broad outlines? What I would like to see is a voluntary, voluntary display of patriotism by corporate Nigeria. Uh, there are corporate social services. For a private General Rabala, so I'm delighted uh, having you always on Good Morning Nigeria. But sir, if you will, if you will permit <laughs> me just two minutes. Okay. Uh, two, minutes. Uh, two minutes? Two minutes. One minute. Uh, Quickly, I would 30 like... Seconds. I would, 30 seconds. I would want us to really sensitize to ourselves to the fact that really bad things with huge human implications are happening in the Northeast. That every spoon of rice you take in the comfort of your home Every day you open the door and you see your children sleeping, you should have a sense of shame. Please come to the reality. Being involved in two tune up games, playing 1 1 draw against Angola, and winning 1 0 in their second friendly game against Ivory Coast. The build of matches in Victoria is to help the Sondo Lisses to third side fine tune their preparation for the 2016 China edition. At the last edition of the championship, Super Eagles ended. In under since August 2012, over allegations that he and Ali Mamluk, the head of the Syrian security services, transported explosives and planned attacks and assassinations of political and religious figures in Lebanon. His trial has been postponed many times because of the absence of Mamluk, who remains in Syria. But after a judge separated the cases against the two men, 
a first session of Samar's trial began in April 2015. He was sentenced in a military tribunal to four and a half years in prison after undercover videos were leaked showing Samaha speaking. is the network service of the NTA. Gas pipelines are the arteries for powering electricity. When the artery is... NTA, you can't. The finals of the men and women African Cup of Nations. It's always frenetic. On days such as this, there are no tribes, no religion.